Hey kids, and welcome to Designed by Wingnut Social. I'm your host, Darla Jethro Powell. I am so excited to be back in the studio. And if you can hear, my voice is still recovering from basically an eight-week <laughs> flu coupled with laryngitis. I had maybe 10 days there where I wasn't sick. And then my fiance's family came into a town for Christmas and got me sick all over again. So I have literally not had a voice. So thank you for bearing with us with the replays, which were some excellent replays, excellent guests. If you did miss them in the first place, it's not, not that much of a loss, right? And I really want to thank my team for filling in for the mini news sessions. So those have all been fresh and live and uh, coming at you with the most relevant social media marketing information for our business, uh, the interior design industry. Thank you so much. I could not have done it without them. In fact, I didn't do it at all. They did it. <laughs> Today's guest, Aaron Smiley, you guys might know him from Smiley and Associates, is a is an accountant. He's our, our my accountant and Wingnut Social's accountant, and he's been a guest on the show before. He was incredibly helpful with the whole PPP situation and when that was going down a couple of years ago. And um, we have him back to discuss our favorite time of year, tax time for LLCs, um, S-Corps, all that biz business. The deadline is March 15th. And uh, we really have to get our ducks in a row. And Aaron dropped some stuff today that I was unaware of. I'm sure you're unaware of, too, that you might or just want to pay attention to and make sure that you're not making some of these mistakes that, that, are, that he's seeing coming into his office from interior designers across the board that he's having to correct. All right. So without further ado, Wingnuts, help me in welcoming Aaron Smiley back to the show. Hey there, Aaron Smiley. Welcome to the show. How the hell are you? Darla, I'm doing great. My standard answer, actually, this time of year is I will be doing a lot better in about three months from now. Granted, depending on where we are when you ask me, changes that three-month time period. But right now, it's I'll be a lot better three months from now. Yeah, this is a crazy time of year for you with taxes and everything. And um, it's, been a, it's been a hot minute since we've had you on the show. It's been a, at least two or three years. Has it, it been? It, it has <laughs> been. Um, and thank you for allowing me back. All right. And just a full transparency, you are my personal and business accountant for Wingnut and uh, the Darla Powell. Um, the Darla Powell <laughs> Enterprise. <laughs> yeah. So no shame in this game. Um, I love you. You're brilliant. And I'm really looking forward to the value bombs you're going to drop here on the show. Well, I'm a little squeaky because I'm coming over, overcoming um, being sick for like the half of my life for 2022. So forgive me if I'm squeaky. It, it, it adds character. So this is the busy season for you with businesses, with LLCs, with all your clients. Why? <laughs> um, why? Well, unfortunately, the time of year and the scheduling of when returns are done, it's a very condensed season uh, in order to get a lot of work done. So just from a timeline standpoint, right now, we're actually working on 1099s. Um, so if you had anybody, any vendors that you paid more than $600 to, uh, you have to have your 1099s filed by the end of the month. Um, I see you should, maybe I need to prepare your 1099s. Thank you for the reminder. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so probably. 1099s come out now. And then, uh, on March 15th is the deadline for LLC returns, S corporation returns. And then April 15th is the deadline for individual returns and C corporation. returns. Yeah. And that's. That's a lot. It, they just changed that to six hundred dollars, didn't they, last year? Or am no, I the six hundred has been pretty consistent. What they what was just changed. There was a lot of talk with uh, certain entities, Venmo in particular, um, ah, okay, where Venmo yeah. was going to lower the threshold where they were going to send a ten ninety nine to a ten ninety nine k specifically. And that I just think there was a lot of uproar just from a compliance standpoint. Uh, so that's something that will not be in effect for the twenty twenty two year. Uh, but maybe Good. coming down the pike in the 2023 year. Well, they just get you from all angles, don't they? They do. Mm -hmm. We we are on a self-reporting system. Um, so it, it is on the honor system in most cases. Uh, what the 10, I know you kind of get a chuckle, depending on whose honor, <laughs> I guess, really depends on what and when gets filed. So, you know, with that being said, what the 1099 does, it essentially provides backup and documentation for the person paying saying that I've got proof, I've got paper, that I'm actually substantiating the deduction that I'm taking on the return based on these 1099s that I've issued. And from the IRS standpoint, if I send you a 1099, let's say for $1,000, and you don't report that on your return, you're going to get a notice from the IRS saying that they've received uh. from third parties um, that you need to pay this $1,000. So 
Although we are on the honor system, this 1099 reporting mechanism uh, essentially tries to police that uh, in a little bit better of a fashion. What happens if you're an interior designer and you have vendors who aren't um, giving you 1099s? Do you have to hunt after them and say, hey, give me a 1099? You do. Um, you essentially have to request a W-9 um, from all the vendors oh, that okay. you're working for or working with. Um, essentially, the W-9 is going to show and prove that uh, the person that you're paying is, is essentially allowed to work here. Um, oh, okay. You have to do your best case effort in tracking down the information. If someone doesn't give it to you, um, if you're unable to obtain it, what could happen down the road is that they would be subject to backup withholding. So if you are saying, I'm going to pay you the thousand, but because you haven't provided a W-9 for me, for whatever reason, maybe you don't want to file the return, maybe you don't have a social, uh, you're not allowed to work here, uh, you could be subject to backup withholding, uh, meaning you would essentially get less that amount you as the issuer of the 1099 would be the one remitting the taxes. Uh, so it's not, it's not something that you want to really do. And, yeah. and most people that you, I would imagine, most people that you're working with do understand uh, and do provide the W-9 for you. Yeah. That, that, I mean, we haven't, we don't, I don't think we have an issue. <laughs> I was just curious about that. It's been a hot minute since I've done the interior design work. I, and I remember getting all these 1099s and W9s and stuff. I'm like, what the hell is this? But because I wasn't handling it. So, okay. So Aaron, let's, let's get into, since we're, we're in the hot seat right now, having to do the taxes for our LLCs, our S corps and et cetera. What are some of the biggest um, mistakes or biggest pain points that you're seeing when designers are coming to you to do your taxes that you can, um, uh, give advice to the audience to make sure they have their ducks in a row before they come to a professional like yourself. Yeah, I think um, I may have even said this the last time we spoke, but it's certainly okay. important, I think, to emphasize shoe boxes are yeah, for shoes. Yeah, it's been a minute. Right, it has. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the adage still is the same. So shoe boxes are still for shoes. Um, I think that now that the year is over, you should certainly have um, a, a profit and loss. You should have your bank account reconciled. Uh, you should have somewhat of an idea um, as to what your yearly business looks like. And there are a couple of points during the year to kind of make sure that you focus on that. Um, you should be paying quarterly estimates. Um, if you're in the interior design business, sales tax is probably a consideration uh, where you need to be filing either monthly or quarterly. So there are certain times during the year where you're kind of forced uh, to take a look and take an inventory, if you will, of what your business is and, and what you have. So I think when you're trying to go back in time and prepare a year's worth of statements, um, I think that could be problematic. You know, you may not remember what this one charge was back in February, but if you keep up with it during the year, it's a lot easier to, to kind of maintain and, and know what those expenses are. So, you know, trying to do it all at once, uh, which we see, I think, is brings frustration not only to the individual, but also it, it can create a lot of extra work for the accountant as well especially, again, in a very right. condensed amount of time of filing. Um, so I would say making sure that, you know, all of your vendors and you've collected W-9s for the year, uh, making sure, again, you've got your profit okay. and loss, you've got your balance sheet in order, uh, making sure you've paid quarterly estimates during the year. And if you haven't, at least knowing what that income number is to kind of set the expectation level of what, you're go what the number is that you're going to owe. I mean, you don't necessarily want to be surprised um, because maybe you're not a good <laughs> saver. Uh, you've already spent the money, right. um, and the tax is going to be what the tax is, and it is going to be due. So I think uh, a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention throughout the year or, or with the mindset of, I can make it up at a later point in time. Uh, I'll have more business. I'll have more clients. Uh, you know, I'm moving now. I need the money today, um, and I'll just sure. pay later. That could be a dangerous proposition that may not necessarily work out for you at the end. So it is better to pay quarterly unless you're like super, super good with money and you want to earn interest on that money or something. Is that a benefit? Yeah. That's not um, even, I mean, that's, don't even don't even do that. Well, simply, yes. I mean, again, it, it really does depend on the individual um, and their threshold. Uh, number one for saving um, cash flow management. So the benefit of paying quarterly, essentially, it matches the income coming in that quarter with the tax payment mm -hmm. going out. So, you know, you make X, you pay Y, you keep up with it throughout yeah. the year and you avoid mistakes. You know, you avoid surprises. Better be on the safe side. Again, it, 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 we have clients that kind of play both sides. Some people say, I don't want to give the government an interest-free loan. 
I'd rather have exactly. access to my money. I have expenses coming up. I would rather kind of be in control of that myself. Other people, and really depending on what industry you're in, if you don't pay enough during the year, you could be subject to an underpayment penalty. Ooh, that sounds not good. You know, they try and do what they do, again, under this self-reporting system to impose penalties and to charge penalties and try and uh, encourage people to make those payments during the year. If you don't, though, and depending, again, what industry you're in, if you have an opportunity to invest that money and the economic climate that we were in last year where the market didn't do as well, it may not have been the best idea. But if you are investing the money and earning a better percentage on the money than what the underpayment penalty is, you would still be coming ahead on the spread. So some people right. do like to play that game. Some people do like to go that route. Um, other people, again, like to belts and suspenders and play it by the book and pay what they owe because they find that it, it does better help them throughout the year. You know, that way they don't have $30,000 extra sitting in their bank account, uh, which <laughs> yeah. could be very tempting uh, to spend. Now that we, we t- discussed um, one of the mistakes that, designers make or small business owners owners make in the green room as well that revolved around miscategorizing your employees and independent contractors. Talk me through that. Correct. So um, essentially, if you're hiring people to do work for you, um, there are several factor and point tests to determine whether they're classified as an independent contractor or an employee. An independent okay. contractor will receive a 1099 at the end of the year. Right. And there are no income taxes withheld for them, whereas an employee will receive a W-2 at the end of the year. There are income taxes that are withheld on what they receive, and you as the employer have to pay half of their payroll taxes. So you as the employer have okay. to pay Social Security and Medicare. So a lot of, a lot of people try and, in a way to kind of save money. You know, I don't want to pay the payroll taxes. I don't want to have a payroll company. I'll just make them a 1099. Uh, give them a 1099 at the end of the year. Right. Um, the miscategorization could come through payroll audits. Um, it could be random. The biggest issue that we see this come about, though, and if you will, being found out, you have somebody working for you. They should be an employee. You're calling them an independent contractor, and you have a falling out. So now they go and apply for unemployment insurance. But there is no record of them being an employee. And you paying mm-hmm. the unemployment insurance on their behalf. So now all of a sudden, it's a known issue. And payroll taxes are one item that owners are personally liable for. So if this was an issue from 2020, you would have to go back. Mm-hmm. There would be interest. There would be penalties. And you would still have to pay the payroll tax. Hey, if you're a longtime listener of Design by Wingnut Social, you probably have heard me talk about our amazing social media marketing strategy for interior designers and architects and how really, really good it is. I mean, five-star reviews across the board, but just don't take my word for it. Listen to Stacy Martin of The Fresh Maker. Before using Wingnut Social, I was lost and crying in a dark corner of the internet. I had no idea how to really run my social media in a way that attracted those dream clients I was looking for and really grew my social media following. So as a longtime listener of the Wingnut Social podcast, naturally I reached out to Darla Powell and her awesome team for help and help they did. It was an amazing experience. I received a step-by-step tutorial on how to increase engagement, how to increase likes, and ultimately how to capture those dream clients and those dream projects I was really looking for. And the whole process just exceeded my expectations. I could not recommend Wingnut Social enough. They're so fun to work with. They really know what they're doing. And I am so glad I turned to them for help with my social media marketing. Wingnut Social, we love you. Thank you, Stacey Martin. We love you too. And we love to see the results that you're achieving using the Wingnut Social strategy. Thank you so much. How do you determine or how does the IRS determine that they should have been an employee? Uh, You know what I mean? Like, what is the differ- What is the deciding factor there? So th- the main element is control. If you are controlling okay. what they do, when they do, how they do, how much they get paid, they're an employee. So one of the biggest okay. misconceptions is, well, they're part-time. Part-time, mm-hmm. full-time, that designation does not matter. That doesn't come into the equation right. on whether or not they're going to be classified as an employee or an independent contractor. So if they're sitting in your desk, if, you have, if they have an email address, 
again, if you're determining how much they they get paid, if they don't have the freedom and the flexibility to work on the project how they want. They're representing, let's say, in your instance, Wingnut. Right. They're an employee. If it's a lighting director, if it's somebody that's, you know, helping consulting, if they have an entity, if they do that same type of work for multiple people, if they set their own rate, it would be more of an independent contractor relationship. So, uh, you know, it's not so much what you want to call them, right? It's what it, what the actual relationship (laughs) looks like. And that's what either at the federal level they'll look at or the state and local level they'll look at, uh, to determine whether or not they are an employee or an independent contractor. I'm sure we just raised some hackles on some listeners out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it it could have been, uh, you know, oops, you know, yeah. I guess this person that I've been paying should have been, an, you know, should have been an employee. I mean, the, the true yeah. cost, once you factor payroll taxes, once you factor some various unemployment insurances, both at the federal and the state level, and possibly payroll tax filings and, and you know, having a payroll company do, help you, it's about a 10% yeah. bump on what you're actually paying. So. Yeah. If you're paying someone fifty thousand dollars for the year, they're an employee. Your true cost is about fifty five thousand. If they're right. an independent, con- if you're paying them as an independent contractor, but they are an employee, you're only paying them the fifty. But if the issue comes about down the road, that five thousand dollars spread that you could have been paying could easily seventy five hundred, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars with interest and penalties. So mm-hmm. it, it's cheaper to set the business up right at the beginning. You know, you don't want to be uh, penny wise, pound foolish, right? If you will. Yeah. So, you, you know, you kind of want to make smart decisions, appropriate decisions. Um, and from a compliance standpoint, you want to make sure that you're doing what you should be doing. That's good to know. At Wingnut, we only have employees that we don't have any 1099. It's all in-house because I'm a little bit of a control freak. So. <laughs> and, and, exactly. And that, and, they, and that, that proves it right there, right? Control is the yeah. underlying uh, kind of decision on whether or not they're going to be an employee or an independent contractor. Right. So interior designers, architects, um, a lot of us sell our own product or we have a, a retail business and then there's a sales tax factor there. And that was something else that you brought up that there, you're seeing a lot of issues with um, the sales tax. What are we doing wrong in that arena? Not necessarily that something is being done wrong. Um, okay. Sales tax considerations, there are certain, uh, certainly from the interior design standpoint, you're selling chairs, you're selling furniture, mm-hmm. you're selling, you know lighting, whatever the case may be, these tangible objects are subject to sales tax. Sales tax usually works to the point of delivery. Okay? So if you are shipping a product to a, different, to a certain state, provided you have nexus, nexus is a fancy word for presence, if you will. So if you have an office in a particular state, if you have employees in a particular state, that gives rise to nexus and would give rise to a sales tax filing requirement. So, for instance, we're in New York. If Mm -hmm. our offices are in New York, if all of our employees are in New York, if I'm an interior designer, any furniture that is being shipped to points in New York, I would have to charge sales tax to the underlying customer. If I'm shipping product to a different state, Mm -hmm. there would not be sales tax that would need to be charged for that particular order going to that particular state. Certain states like New York have different sales tax rates for every county that's in the state. So you need to know what county you're shipping to. Um, and certain services are subject to sales tax. For instance, interior design services um, you know, could be subject to sales tax depending on where those are being provided. Um, oh, really? So sales tax, in addition to payroll taxes that I mentioned earlier, they're both the owners are both personally liable for those if those are not paid. Um, and or collected. Most interior yeah. designers also have resale certificates. So when they go to a particular vendor, they will provide a resale certificate so they're not being charged sales tax on the purchase. And then they're turning mm-hmm. around and selling it to the client um, where sales tax would be charged. The other area that they look at is um, markup. So a lot of interior design, a lot of interior designers will have markup revenue. Hopefully, yes. They'll buy something for a price, <laughs> sell it for an additional price. That additional price is what the sales tax um, needs to be charged on, not the initial price. 
Oh, okay. Okay. And so um, our e-designers out there listening, if they're selling product or linking to product and making profit on that, you're saying if uh, you have an e-designer in Florida and they're selling it in California, they're good not to charge sales tax on that? Correct. Provided they don't have any presence in California. That's right. Or any LLC or agent out there. Okay. Correct. Now there, there's physical presence and then there's economic presence for sales tax purposes. Mm. And they're different for income tax purposes. So there was a Wayfair oh, okay. decision, um, big, 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 big court case, Wayfair decision, essentially saying that depending on how many sales are shipped to a certain state, that could give rise to nexus. And now you would be subject to sales tax, even if you don't have an employee in that state, even uh-huh. if you don't have an office in that state. So every state has a different threshold. So if you are in e-commerce and you are selling in multiple states, you would really have to look at what the amounts are. And how quickly mm-hmm. you would be encroaching those those uh, sales tax numbers and, and sales tax thresholds to determine whether or not you would have to file and register in those states. Wow. They're, they're going to get you. One way or the other. <laughs> wow. That is crazy. I had no idea. Aaron, is there anything that well, we've forgotten to say as far as getting your getting your crap in order <laughs> um, to make sure that before we come to you, to do our taxes for our business, um, that we're not making you spend hundreds and hundreds of hours, that this is going to be an efficient process and make all of our lives happier. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you think the audience needs to hear before we get into the what up wingnut round? I, I would say earlier, earlier than, be, uh, than later, uh, you know, the okay. sooner that you kind of go through these decisions, the sooner that you decide to work with an accountant, the, the earlier that you can get your books in order, your profit and loss, your balance sheet, whether you use QuickBooks, whether you use uh, any other type of software that can kind of help with that. Um, the sooner the better. And th- there are no bad questions to ask in terms of, can I deduct this? How should I set this up? Uh, what's the proper way for me to kind of structure the business and, and look at various deductions? Um, you know, no one wants to go through an audit. Um, audits do happen. Sometimes they're random. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. you would report something on a return that may be a perfectly legitimate, um, you know, in, in air quotes, ordinary and necessary uh, business expense. Um, right. You need to make sure that you've got the backup documentation for it. You need to make sure that you've got a business justification for it. Um, you know, that way, if you were audited, you're properly prepared for it and you can handle it and answer any questions that may arise um, from what you're deducting. So I would say, you know, don't don't be afraid to categorize something as, you know, what it should be called. Um, if you do have questions in June, in August, it's better to ask those questions in June and August uh, than waiting until the following year in January and February. Um, you know, I would say, and possibly slightly biased, but hire a bookkeeper, uh, hire an yes. accountant, um, especially in the interior design business and with the amount of TV shows that there are, um, everybody thinks that they could be a designer. And similar to me, with TurboTax, everybody thinks that they could do it. Um, But know where you need to hire a professional and make that hire. Um, You know, again, we're dealing with professionals. We're dealing with people that charge for their time. uh, We're dealing with people that are experts in their industry. Uh, I think it's really important to kind of leverage other experts uh, to help you with what you're not good at. Absolutely. Like social media marketing. Hey, what do you, what do you know? Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, we, I have a, I have a bookkeeper and without, I, there's no way, there's no way I could do it without a bookkeeper. It's so important. And that actually, I just spoke to Sarah last night and she said she's getting all the stuff ready to send over to you. So perfect. Be on the lookout for that. Aaron Smiley. Now I have to ask you, are you ready for the what up wingnut round? I'm ready. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? He did it right. Okay, all right. You're stuck on a deserted island, but you can have your one favorite food forever. What's it going to be? For all of eternity. Yeah, like your favorite food forever. So you got to think about, am I going to get sick of it? You know what I mean? Am I gonna, I'm on an island, so am I going to get scurvy if I, you know? I, I, I mean, I think it's going to have to be a black and white cookie. Um, uh, just, nice, good yeah, choice. Yeah, you know, like you never get sick of those, and you can kind of eat a little bit at a time. I love it. Awesome. And last but not least, please recommend a book that has had an impact on you either personally or professionally. Um, Last very good book uh, that I read was called Let the Great World Spin. And uh, I 
not so much on a professional development, but certainly uh, on the personal side. Uh, very good book, um, kind of teaching and letting you know that, you know, we're not really in charge of this and uh, the entire interconnectedness of what we are all doing, um, you know, kind of just really emphasizes, you know, be a good person, do it the right way, if you will. Um, I would definitely recommend reading that one. All right, Aaron Smiley, thank you so much. This is always helpful as usual. Please tell the audience where they can go to find out more about you and your awesome sauce services, and we will call it a day. Well, thank you. You can look at our website. Uh, it's Smiley, S-M-Y-L-E, and Associates, so smileyandassociates.com. Uh, we are also on Instagram at, at Smiley Taxes. Uh, I would highly recommend checking that out as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's great seeing you again. Darla, always a pleasure. All right. So I don't know about you, but I learned a thing or two in our, my conversation with Aaron. And I just have to say, thank God I am not doing my own taxes. I am not doing my own bookkeeping. That was really super interesting about the 1099 employee situation. I didn't really realize that all those little standards had to be met. Right. I haven't done that, but I'm, it was just curious to see, like, why? Why couldn't you just 1099 an employee for the whole year if they work for you? And, that, and he really helped to delineate why, why what that is. And uh, making sure that we have our sales tax in a row and that we're getting our 1099s out. There's just there's just so much. I mean, we really we really just scrape the surface here with Aaron. You can always check out all the information in our show notes at wingnutsocial.com. Again, don't forget to go over there and check out Wingnut Academy and see um, our fir very first course. Thank you for joining us in this new year. And thank you for your patience with the replays while I was recovering. Love you and appreciate you. 2023, I feel it's going to be a really good year, even though eggs are $12 a dozen. <laughs> I'm actually seriously thinking about putting some chickens in my backyard. Don't tell my HOA. All right, that's it for this week. Check us out, wingnutsocial.com. Remember, until next time to get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great.